Hello, my name is Julie McCrossan, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak at Frontiers 2021 about a head and neck cancer patient's perspective. I was diagnosed and treated in 2013 uh, with stage four HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer. So human papillomavirus was the cause, and it was in my tonsils, tongue and throat. And I was treated with 33 consecutive days of radiation therapy and weekly chemotherapy. And I was treated at St. Vincent's Hospital, Sydney and the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. And I just had the tremendous benefit uh, of having a multidisciplinary team in a cancer centre with a very high volume of my particular kind of cancer patient. And my message to you at this conference is really a plea for help. We need your help to lobby with your professional associations for publicly funded dental care for head and neck cancer patients. Earlier this year, I made a series of short videos about the dental needs of head and neck cancer patients, and I'm going to share short segments of those videos with you now. Uh, this year for World Head and Neck Cancer Day 2021, 27th of July, we're launching a series of videos that look at improving dental care for head and neck cancer patients. And we're doing it because when you have a head and neck cancer, your teeth and the quality of your mouth are significantly affected by the treatment and the side effects of the treatment. And we wanna raise awareness about that help patients know how they can improve and care for their own uh, teeth and mouth after treatment. But most importantly, uh, we're lobbying our governments to provide publicly funded dental care to head and neck cancer patients. Associate Professor Richard Gallagher is Director of Cancer Services at the St Vincent's Health Network in Sydney, and he's also Director of Head and Neck Services at the St Vincent's Health Service there. He's an ENT surgeon and he specialises in the use of transoral robotic surgery, which unfortunately I wasn't eligible for back in 2013. But this year, Richard Gallagher wrote a blog all about the dental needs of head and neck cancer patients, and we'll share a link to that blog with you. What barriers does Richard Gallagher face in getting dental care for his head and neck cancer patients? There are lots of barriers to getting my patients seen and managed by dentists. And, uh, and they start at the beginning of treatment and stretch through to after treatment. So I'm very lucky initially when I see a patient, um, I'll have them assessed by the dentist at the hospital who is very good. We'll see them on the same day that I see the patient and then they'll advise me about whether they, uh, particularly if we think they're definitely going to have radiotherapy, um, uh, whether they need any teeth removed. Even a lot of the patients who, who don't need radiotherapy, a lot of my patients have bad teeth and they, it, it, you know, they need them removed anyway. Um, so uh, they advise me. And in fact, over the years, I've taught myself and with the dentist, he's taught me how to remove teeth because if they're not removed in a timely fashion, it really delays patients' treatment. And I find that really frustrating because when I hear stories that a patient has, you know, they, they get seen, they get told that they need to go to radiotherapy treatment, and then all of a sudden they've got to have teeth removed, but it takes a month for them to see a dentist, and then another week or two to get the teeth removed, and then they've got to let that heal up for a few weeks, and then they're going to start their radiotherapy. It's two months or three months down the track, and, and that's truly for, for head and neck cancer, and for all cancers, it's unacceptable to have to wait so long to, to progress onto treatment. And then there are the problems that we strike immediately. Uh, you know, there may be problems during treatment, but really it's in that period of time after treatment. These poor patients, we've removed their teeth. Um, they've got their mouths are sore. Um, it eventually settles down. They may need dentures. It's incredibly difficult to get a set of dentures into a patient. Um, I mean, they have to settle down after, surge, after, after treatment. But it's also the problem of getting them done for, you know, public patients, you know, getting them to get dentures fitted is incredibly frustrating. And patients have ongoing problems with their mouth and with their teeth. And to get them to see a dentist is difficult. They can see a dentist privately, but a lot of our patients can't afford to do that. 
you know, you, you're lucky you were able to afford to see, you know, you can see a dentist, I can see a dentist, but a lot of the patients really can't afford to see a dentist. And then to stand in a line at the dental hospital or somewhere like that, where in fact, they may not get looked after, you know, they may be on a big long waiting list is problematic. Um, and then I think really the other, other thing is that it's really the long term. It's about, you know, what happens through the years because we know that if you've had radiotherapy treatment or, we've, or not just radiotherapy, treatment maybe from surgery where the mouth dries out and salivary flow decreases, we know that that impacts on your dental health and it leads to decay and it leads to teeth falling to bits. And um, it's incredibly difficult to get patients seen to get them managed. I will be recommending to everyone who's watching this to look at your blog and we'll have a link to your written blog, which puts out a lot of ideas in a very orderly fashion. But in a nutshell, what is an action, a change to the system that could bring some immediate positive uh, benefit to the head and neck cancer patients, patients that you're dealing with on a daily basis? I'm talking to you today from rural New South Wales. You're in the city as well. What action would help? The, the one thing that would really make a huge difference to our patients is if the government and Medicare gave the ability to selected surgeons who, who treat head and neck cancer patients to be able to refer them on to dentists so that they can get some free dental care. At the present time, and it's in the blog, it makes it clear, it's a very convoluted system um, and it does vary from state to state. It may be that I have to... I have to send a patient back to a GP and get them to do a plan to get a patient referred on to see a dentist. But 25% of my patients, maybe more, don't have a GP. So they can't even do that. So it's very frustrating. So if I could change something, it would be please ask the health department, allow some of the surgeons who look after patients with these problems to be able to do direct referrals into the system to dentists and do care plans. Dr. Nick Andrews is a visiting dental officer at three major hospitals in Sydney, working with cancer teams at St George Hospital, Westmead Hospital and Liverpool Hospital. And he has 27 years of experience working with head and neck cancer patients and assessing them, and he's in private practice as well. Now, when I was a head and neck cancer patient, I was astonished to learn that multiple tooth extractions prior to treatment are common for head and neck cancer patients. In this country, we still do some full mouth clearances. This means extracting all the teeth prior to treatment and extractions of up to eight to 10 teeth for head and neck cancer patients are common. And socioeconomic factors are often the key factor in this clinical decision. Putting it simply, if a patient could not afford dental care before cancer, they will not be able to do so after cancer. And extractions of teeth after radiation to that area can lead to a trauma where the wound will not heal and you can get bone death. In this talk, I'm going to focus on the long-term side effects of treatment, especially after five years, when cancer patients like me stop seeing their multidisciplinary team at the hospital or cancer centre. And it's the side effect of dry mouth due to damaged salivary glands that can be very, very tough. Here's Nick Andrews. There's a real issue with uh, long-term survivorship and, and follow-up. As you say, after five years, you pat it on the back and told everything's great, we don't need to see you again, and you're considered cured. Um, but we know that a certain percentage of these cancers will recur, and we do know there's also a very rare risk, but a possibility of... Um, long-term radiation-induced disease that may occur. Um, many of these manifestations develop many, many years down the track. Uh, certainly damage to jawbone um, is progressive. Uh, the potential for trismus or limited jaw opening, which impacts on the ability to maintain the mouth, um, is a progressive if, uh, condition if not diagnosed and managed early. The potential for radiation caries or rapid tooth decay in the context of a dry mouth um, can, can be a significant problem down the track. So there needs to be a better way for patients to be able to reconnect more seamlessly into um, the treatment centre in the first place and seek proper follow-up care. 
Let's take a look now at the kind of oral health challenges that head and neck cancer patients suffer. We're now going to see, if we could go to the next uh, image, please, we're going to see three examples of the kind of almost worst case scenario, if you could explain, Nick, the sort of damage to the teeth that can happen. This um, is a series of, of photographs of a, one of our typical, for want of a better word, head and neckers, chronic um, smoker, drinker, poor general health, um, poor maintenance, who presented um, with a worn down dentition, as you can see there, those teeth uh, have been worn heavily. Down at the root level, there's brown discoloration, early root caries there, early decay. He uh, went on to have radiation treatment. He was put on our preventive protocols, but compliance was an issue. Uh, he was lost to follow up for a while. Um, he was from a geographically remote area and it was too difficult for him to come into his appointments. And so when we next saw him um, about 18 months later, if we go to the next photo, you'll see that all of the enamel, all of the white mineral part of his tooth is just completely debonded from the root surfaces underneath. It's just uh, completely worn away and he's got rapid, rampant decay on those teeth. So if you were to put a probe in those teeth, it would sink in a good millimetre and a half or so on all of those teeth. You can also see incidentally in the back there, there's crusting on his tongue. His mouth's very dry. You get dead skin cells accumulating there. They'd normally be washed away by the saliva. He hasn't got that working for him. So he's got this crusty, dry, swollen, um, atrophic tongue, which is a manifestation of the dry mouth. We saw him again. He'd lost a follow-up for a while, saw him again. This is two years and three months post-radiation. Is that the and next the, image? In the, final, in the final photograph, you can see that he's had rampant decay all the way through those teeth, decay ring-barking the root surface all the way around to the point where the crown just amputates completely. And again, you can appreciate the, um, the debris accumulation of, um, of old dead skin cells um, on the tongue there and in a very, very dry mouth. So this is the sort of patient uh, uh, that we really can't get on top of. You can't maintain his dentition in the context of the severe dryness that he um, would experience. Fortunately for him, we identified that he would likely be a problem. And so we took the precaution of removing all of his back teeth, which were in the area of the high dose radiation. That we was prior him. to treatment. That was mean? prior to treatment, yeah. So we anticipated that he would have problems. We didn't expect that the remaining teeth would uh, fall apart as quickly as they did. But luckily, um, they were out of the radiation field and they went on to be extracted as normal with no risk of complications. So that, that was a good outcome in the end for him and he ended up just having to wear dentures. I want to make it completely clear to you that modern precise radiation therapy is an effective treatment that saves lives. In fact, it saved mine back in 2013. But what I'm trying to highlight here is the devastating impact of the failure to provide publicly funded dentistry to the Australian population and how it leads to very poor teeth. And then this has a dreadful impact on head and neck cancer patients. Treatment for head and neck cancer by surgery, by radiation, indeed the impact of some of the uh, uh, chemotherapies as well, is an assault on the oral and dental health of patients. And we need special dental attention for the rest of our lives. Here I am speaking again to Dr. Nick Andrews. Uh, and I'll just begin, if I may, by uh, Nick, by showing a, a picture of my tumour before and after radiation, because uh, I had stage four oropharyngeal cancer, tonsils, tongue and throat, treated in 2013 with 33 sessions of radiation and weekly chemo. And you'll see there on the left uh, is an image of uh, all that lumpy stuff is deep down here, and that's cancerous tumours, stage four cancerous tumours, and the photo's taken a little bit of anaesthesia in the nose and then a tube goes down and my surgeon took that photo. Mm -hmm. If you look at the image on the right, that's about a, a year to 18 months after my radiation treatment. Uh, the burning has healed up. I'm able to speak and swallow and talk again, and you can see it's completely gone. If I could just show you the next image, and that's me being treated, I'm laying flat on a, what's called a linear accelerator, a radiation machine, and the radiation machine is 
firing radiation at the different angles uh, into my tumour to kill it. The mask is a safety mask or immobilisation mask to keep you completely still. And uh, that's the treatment process. And so I'm glad I had this treatment. I'm alive because of it. Um, but we're now going to explore some of the challenges uh, that may follow. Uh, I will ask um, for the next slide, which shows damage in the mouth caused by radiation. And just before you explain it, if I could say if there are any patients or family watching this, you have a multidisciplinary team, including a speech pathologist and a nurse, as well as your medical team. And we are given pain relief and we are given help with a, a whole range of products so that we don't suffer. I just really want to make that clear. And if you are in treatment looking at this and there is any suffering, talk to your nurse or your doctor or members of your team because there is uh, oral pain relief and there is uh, um, there are uh, products we can use, many of them by a company called Bioteen, that help you cope with this because it is a bit tough to look at. But can you explain what we're looking at now on the side of the tongue here and inside the mouth? So this is a radiation mucositis, just a breakdown of the lining of the surface of the skin as a result, again, of the, the radiation damage knocking off cells faster than your body can replace them. And it causes this painful ulceration. Um, the good news is there is good pain management available, um, as Julie has just said, and it's a temporary condition. It'll usually recover within six to 12 weeks at most for the vast majority of patients. So you've just got to try to get through this initial phase um, and it will get better. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to finish with one other equity issue for head and neck cancer patients. As we know, there are very exciting innovations in care coming for head and neck cancer patients, and some are already here, but they're expensive, and so is the clinical training. Transoral robotic surgery is not equally available for public patients in Australia or New Zealand. We need a public register of where the TORS robots are and whether public patients have access. The latest MRI-guided radiation therapy machines deliver less damage to healthy tissue. We need equal access for public patients to this latest radiation therapy technology. And finally, proton therapy is coming to Australia and proton therapy is being used internationally for head and neck cancer patients who are eligible and who can benefit. We need the Australian government to fund this treatment for head and neck cancer patients when the Australian Bragg Centre for Proton Therapy and Research opens up for treatment for patients in 2022 and 2023. And our New Zealand cousins need access as well. Thank you very much.